I think midlife is a really good time to take a look at your life and see what's working, what's making me truly happy and what really lights me up. And then what's not working? What are the changes I need to make? Taking a really hard, deep dive on what is Um, what's fueling you and where do you want to go in your second adulthood and making those changes. Midlife. There's a word for you. And to be honest, it gets a bad rap, doesn't it? It's almost like puberty. (laughs) Because with this rite of passage comes a number of shifts, physically and mentally, aches and pains, menopause, menopause. It's all there for the taking. But you know what? You can rock this time of your life, too. Dr. Ellen Albertson is here to show you how that's done. She is the midlife whisperer, and she's been helping women find their confidence, their clarity and compassion for the next chapter of their lives to make it the best chapter of their lives. And she knows us because she's been through it. And don't we learn from our experiences? So on this episode of Holistically Speaking, Dr. Ellen breaks it down for you. She's going to share her seven simple steps that she uses herself. We talk about everything from finding love to finding cancer and how she rocked that too. Plus, Dr. Ellen is giving away a copy of her book, Rock Your Midlife, so that you can be the rock star that you are in this next chapter of your life. All I can say to that is rock on. Dr. Ellen, it is such a delight to have you on the show and to see you again. I just had the joy of being on your show, Rock Your Midlife, and having you here to tell your story is really a gift. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Hillary. And it was so fun to have you on and talk about havening. I butchered that and now I understand why we call it havening and how powerful it is. And it was such a joy to have you on as well. So thanks for having me on your show. It was it was such a pleasure and to learn about sleep because goodness knows we need more of it, especially in our midlife, don't we? Oh yeah, my goodness. And so many of us aren't getting enough, but it is really key. I'm realizing it is one of the most important self-care things you can do is getting a good seven to nine hours every single night. Mm, definitely. And, you know, this is something that uh, really resonated with me when I came across your information when I was exploring more about what you do as the midlife whisperer. I love that title. I love that you're going with that. It really it really hit me hard because I'm a woman that's in my late 40s going through perimenopause, about to cross over into the big M very soon. And I don't want to be scared of it. I don't want to be scared of it. I don't want my listeners and those who are part of uh, my tribe here on Holistically Speaking to be too concerned about this transition, this shift in our lives, because it really can be beautiful. And I would love for you to elaborate on that. Sure. Isn't it curious that we fear it? It's so weird. And I think for the longest time, we didn't talk about it. It was under the, you know, in the closet, right? And so the last five years has been a powerful time that we are talking about. And first of all, just to own that it is totally normal and it doesn't have to be, you know, hell in a handbasket. I know for myself, I had some hot flashes, but basically if you do a lot of the self-care things that can really support you. And there are so many amazing healers and physicians out there who are addressing it. So if you are struggling, certainly read more, get help. But I think the main things in terms of, you know, self-care around it are eating a whole food plant-based diet. Getting a good night's sleep, which can be challenging if you are having insomnia, hot flashes, you know, night sweats, things like that. But certainly um, doing things like having good sleep hygiene, going easy on the alcohol. Alcohol can really create a lot of problems with your hormonal balance, particularly late at night if you feel like I need a nightcap to get to sleep. Um, You know, doing things like either sleeping in the buff or sleeping in, you know, in a special wicking material. Mm. I kept a spray bottle next to my bed that had water and like lemon juice or uh, essential oil in it, lemon essential oil to spray on myself. And, you know, just know you're not alone and you will get through this. And the other side's pretty nice. First of all, there's no chance of pregnancy, you know, and sex can still be a lovely thing. And I know I'm having a great time with my amazing fiance and it's awesome. Um, And, you know, things that we think like um, weight gain and Uh, grouchiness and those things, they're not inevitable. But if you are experiencing issues, certainly 
in the workplace, talk to the people you work with, get some compensations, you know, if you're having a bad day, but just practicing also self-compassion, which is something I advocate for everybody, but being kind to yourself rather than judgmental, instead of being like, why is this happening to me? This shouldn't be happening to me. I don't like this. Just, okay. How would I talk to a good friend who is going through menopause? I'd be like, okay, sister, like take a breath, drink your water, you know, take some rest, take a nap, get some exercise, take care of your beautiful self. Mm, I, I love everything you're sharing there. And it's it hits the nail on the head on so many levels because we have our sisterhood and we obviously are going to surround ourselves with like minded people, you know, and look to your friends, look to your sisterhood to talk about these things. And I, I'm wondering if it's because we get to this point in our lives where we start thinking about midlife like we did puberty. And puberty was always one of those things that you either were bullied or you suffered or you saw your body changing in one way. And this is that latter part of our lives where we're seeing it happen again. So I think it also brings us back to that the, the inner child kind of stuff where we're like, hmm, I remember the 13 and puberty wasn't good to me. So here I am at like 49, 50 and perimenopause and menopause is not good to me. So some of it must be psychological, I imagine. Yeah, and that's a great point, though. But we do look at that adolescence period as a normal transition. And I think menopause needs to be embraced as a normal transition and, you know, allowing our bodies to change and shift. But, you know, maybe recognizing that inner child of, gosh, this is triggering some stuff for me when I was 13 years old and my body was doing things that felt a little weird and maybe even frightening. And that's the way it is now. But I think the more we talk about it, the more we shine a light on it and we say, yeah, this is normal and also see it as this butterfly period, right? Or this caterpillar to butterfly period where midlife can certainly be like you are in a chrysalis. And, you know, Brene Brown talks about midlife as being an unraveling, not a crisis. Crisis is a short lived. It's a divorce. It's a health crisis. It's death of a loved one. But midlife is this kind of unraveling. And I think menopause is a piece of that because most people living in, in female bodies will go through menopause. But, you know, coming out the other end, it could be really amazing if you do the work, if you kind of look at your life and you say, okay, I've been ignoring my body. I better like really start doubling down on the self-care. My relationships, I'm not getting the support that I need. I'm not surrounding myself by people who love me. I need to shift the relationship thing. Maybe even my career. I don't want to be in this hustle culture anymore. It's not supporting this midlife body that I'm living in. You know, taking a look at all of those things and using the challenges that you're facing with midlife and menopause as a period to transform yourself so that you get this juicy second adult. And I think that's one reason we're really talking about it is that we get another huge bunch of decades to live our best life. So mm. like use the period transform, use menopause as a catalyst for that mid midlife. And then you can have this incredible second adult. I'm really looking forward to the next two or three decades. Oh, I like that. That's a positive outlook. Is that a lot of stuff that you cover also in your book? You know, you have Rock Your Midlife, which came out last year, and it's the seven steps to transform yourself and make your next chapter the best, right? Which is basically what you're talking about. What made you want to write the book? Well, three reasons. First of all, when you Google midlife, it is conjoined with crisis. You put it in a thesaurus <laughs> and what comes up is the wrong side of 40. And I'm like, wait, this, this, you know, dialogue, this uh, storyline that we've been fed largely by the media who, you know, I was, I was looking at a, um, an, a advertisement today in the New York Times for shoes. And I'm like, I really like this shoe brand, but why are they showing me all 20 somethings? You know how often I was in New York City a couple of weeks ago and I saw no people at midlife selling me stuff. It was all young people and the young people can't afford the stuff, you know, those of us who can and want it. So, I mean, part of it is we've been fed the storyline that midlife is bad. It's wrong. It's something to be dreaded. And I totally disagree with that. I'm having the best time of my life. So that's number one. I want to change it, the story and talk all about pro-aging, um, you know, taking a bird's eye view on midlife. Number two, as a coach like you, right, we can only work with a handful of people in our lives. And mm. I want to be able to work with more women. I have this great seven-step signature system, and not everybody can afford 
to work with a coach. So I wanted to kind of take my 30 years of experience working with midlife women, put it all in the book and really give people a how-to manual. And number three, I also wanted to share my experience. You know, having gone through midlife, I'm almost 60 now, you're turning, looking at 50, I'm looking at 60. Um, you know, I've been through divorce, I've been mm. through two health crises, I've moved a ton, ton of times reinvented myself and wanted to share my story and my experience and wisdom with other women. I think it's you living what you're what you're talking about, what you're preaching. You're living and walking the walk and talking the talk. You know, you're rocking your midlife, right? So there are a lot of ways that your own story is, well, as what is it? it Brene, I think, said this, that you, your own story could be someone else's survival guide, right? So when people see that you're going through something and you've been through it and you're offering them kind of like guidance in that way, like you said, if they can't afford the one-on-one coaching with us, it gives them a means to be able to tap in, take their time, read through it, process it, and maybe even make it part of a book club. Have you had women that have done that? I have. It's kind of cool. And people send me their pictures of, you know, reading the book or somebody catches somebody reading it on the beach. So I have had women doing a book club. I would say, if you want to do a book club, I am happy to do a Zoom appearance. Oh, that's so And, great. you know, do a little q and um, I haven't had anybody take me up or put it out there that much, but um, I'm ha- always happy to do that. And I think it's a great book club read because it's so actionable and you can drop in at any of the seven steps. You don't have to start with number one, which is authenticity. For me, Everything changed when I learned to love myself, number two, mm-hmm. which is about self-love. So you can read the whole book. You can drop in. There's lots of journaling articles, lots of other resources. So it's really an amazing guide for midlife. When what's interesting is, I don't know if you have younger uh, listeners as well, but I get so many younger people. I was on a podcast the other day for the two 20-year-olds, and they're like, this is totally applicable with where I'm at right now. So it's really a lot of good positive psychology uh, information. I think that generation, the 20 somethings are tapped into things more than we were when we were that age, mainly because of this global village of having digital media living in the digital age. And as a college professor, I see this all the time with my kids that they are they really have their finger on the pulse with stuff. They're they're just thinking a little bit more in an advanced way because they have more possibilities. You and I had to check out an Encyclopedia Britannica that weighed seven thousand pounds to be able to find out the information, okay. right? The minute you got it, right? right? And the minute you get it, and you've got seventeen million books in your library, and they're all heavy. But now it's just finger on the pulse, tap, and you can get any information you can. And I think they're just more evolved. They're, what I'm witnessing with both clients and with my students in that age is that they really do want to live well and live better. So if they're starting at the twenties. Imagine where they could be in their 40s and 50s. Imagine what midlife will be 20 years from now because of this generation right now, you know? Yeah, and we're great examples for them so that yeah. when, you know, when our kids are, are our age, you know, and my, my kids are my age, I want them to be able to have a different experience. Oh, definitely. So you mentioned two of the steps. You mentioned the self-compassion. Uh, what was step two? Um, step two is love yourself. So step one is, is, is know yourself. So that's, know you know, you've got to know yourself because if you don't know yourself, how are you, the heck are you supposed to create an amazing midlife that mm-hmm. jibes with who you truly are? So it's know yourself and then it's love yourself. And in that chapter, I really talk about something called self-compassion, mm-hmm. which is kind of the how of self-love. It's essentially treating yourself the way you would a good friend. Mm. As we should. And I, I equate that to kind of what I talk about with the hug it out theory, which is like, you have to really embrace yourself. If you can't embrace yourself and love yourself, like you say, how can you possibly share that in the world if you're not giving it to the vehicle first, right? So you have those two steps. What can you share the other five? Sure. And the third one is energize yourself. So that's really where I take my expertise as a registered dietitian, as a health and wellness coach, really sharing with midlife women the best way to be energized. So really, it's a whole food plant based diet, we need more protein after 50. It's moving your body, it's dealing with stress, getting rest, getting sleep, all of those things. And also sharing, you know, women actually at midlife have the highest level of depression for any group for our age and gender. And so Mm -hmm. giving some information about that. Number four is rehab your brain. So it's all about neuroplasticity, which Mm -hmm. is a lot of like what you teach that we can formulate our brain. I mean, I had clinical depression in my 40s. And by meditating, learning self-compassion, changing my self-thoughts, 
I don't have clinical depression. I have difficult days like everybody, but it's not these long periods where you just don't want to get out of bed in the morning. So I'm here to say you can wake up energized, joyful, and excited to start your day. You can change your brain and the way you function. Number five is empowering yourself, which is really kind of about um, advocating for yourself, going for what you want, also kind of using that knowing yourself and loving yourself and the law of so, uh, law of attraction to really attract what is truly in your best interest, what's really going to make you happy. Number six is rehab your relationships, which is so important because what happens is, you know, you become the butterfly. All of a sudden, you know, you reach this place. And I have my clients tell me this all the time. It's like, oh my God, like the, the view from up here is incredible. Like, you know, you think about a caterpillar and they're like on the ground eating leaves, the butterfly is like, wow, I'm flying around, really <laughs> colorful. It's all awesome. But your family and friends may still see you as the caterpillar. They're like, no, you're you're still a caterpillar because your perception and your life may totally do a 180. But the people in your life may still see you the way that you were. And so in this chapter, it's really about this three-step process of letting your good girl and your people pleaser go. So stop saying yes to everybody. I think as women, we do that all the time. Um, the second piece is creating some boundaries. So creating a personal bill of rights, creating boundaries. And the third piece is using something called nonviolent communication to mm. get your needs met. Three really effective techniques to help you. And then the last one is enlighten yourself. So this is really about spirituality, which to me is about, you know, being a soul, having a human experience, seeing, you know, where do I find purpose? Where do I find meaning? What's my connection with God, spirit, source, consciousness, whatever you call that, you know, that we really can't name nature, all of those things really um, working on your spiritual practice, working on getting to know yourself on a soul level. Mm. The nonviolent communication is really something we need to embrace more. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I remember talking with Sarah Payton about this with, um, you know, Sarah Payton, she talks, she's, she's, she's a, a really quite an amazing she studies the nonviolent communication and uh, I've had her on the show. She's, she's quite brilliant, but the whole idea of just how we talk to ourselves and the self, the, the words we use and the words we choose can really make a difference, but also just the words we use when people are in crisis or panic, you know, that, that verbal first aid, as it's called, how can we possibly grow and, Aligned with the kind of energy we want if we are really beating ourselves up. And we talk a lot about bullying this day and age. The worst bullies we have are the ones we, we bestow upon ourselves, you know? So the fact that you add that into your steps, I'm really happy to hear that because it's so important. And what is the, what has the feedback been since you released the book? Well, the feedback has been, I would say, 90, 95% super positive. So, you know, you're always, the, the bigger you get, the more you get, you know, occasionally uh, some some dings. But I would say it's incredibly gratifying if you go on Amazon and just put in Rock Your Midlife mm -hmm. and you look at the reviews, people are like, she sounds like a good friend talking to me. She understands exactly where I'm at. This book's really helped me. So it's the, re the reviews so far have been really, really positive and they give me a real charge of that. Wow. This, I mean, writing a book's a lot of work. Um, yeah. And I did this whole baby myself. I self-published it. I've, this is my fifth book. And I put a lot into it and I'm really happy about how it came out and about the response so far. So I want to ask you this. There are a lot of people that are writing books right now. I'm one of them. I'm in the middle of writing my own book. And I know I get a lot of people that ask this, but what would be your sage advice for those who are writing a book? Yeah, I would say start, you know, and get yourself <laughs> a on a start. regular writing schedule. Um, be creative in what works for you in terms of writing it. So I often like to go on long walks when I'm kind of stuck in an area. I'm not quite sure what I want to say. And I dictate into my phone. And of course, you can go phone write to written. So I think that's really helpful. You know, if you can speak, you can write. If you have something to share and say, it's a great 
great platform. Um, I would say also get help if you're not, I know you are, you are a reporter, so you probably have great writing chops, but a lot of everybody does. So certainly you don't have to do it alone. There's great resources out there to support you. I certainly had someone do the layout for me and do the cover. Um, anybody can publish a book these days. It's super easy on Amazon, makes it really possible. And they actually give you a pretty decent cut as well. So it's a really powerful way to get your story out there. I would say also just you got to be authentic. You know, really write from your heart, share your own story, think about who your audience is and who you want to help, you know, have fun with it. But also, you know, creating a writing schedule is really important. I know a lot of people start and they don't finish. I would say start off with just mind mapping. So get an idea of like, what do I want to write? Maybe share our social media with your friends or do some kind of, um, uh, some kind of group to see if, if people are, you know, what they're interested in. If you have a problem in the world that you really want to help fix, that's a great topic to have. It doesn't have to be big either. You can write a, you know, a small book as well. Um, but yeah, just start. And another p- thing that's really powerful is morning pages. So this is mm. something that you know, Julie Cameron, who's written The Artist's Way, has a great book out there. We're all creative beings. It goes back to sort of my spirituality uh, section of my book, but creativity and spirituality really kind of go hand in hand. So it's just great to do two to three pages every, you know, if you can do it every morning, that's a great way to free the writer, the creative within. Yeah. Love the morning pages. We're hearing a lot of people talk about that more and more, which I love. That's great advice. And I think there's some things you even shared that will really empower me to do a little more. Yes, I am a writer. Yes, I put out the newsletters. And every time I write a newsletter, honestly, Ellen, I think that this could be a page in the book, <laughs> you know, when we're because it's cathartic, it's therapeutic, you're getting it out there. And so that that's, that's really good advice. Great purpose, for baby. That's yeah, what it's all about. Amen to that. So I want to just take a moment and say thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you that are listening, if you kind of Scooted through the beginning, Dr. Ellen Albertson is here talking about rocking your midlife. And here's the cool thing. Dr. Ellen has agreed to give away a copy of her book. So I'm going to put all of that out there on the listen notes so that you can figure out how we're going to do that. And uh, you're going to be able to get a copy of this book in your hands. I highly recommend it. And thanks for listening. And of course, let's move on to the fact that we are in October right now. This is Breast Cancer Awareness month and this is something that's relatively a new topic for you to discuss and this is the fact that you yourself were diagnosed with stage one in April and you're now in remission but I would love for you to elaborate what it is like in this rocking your midlife to really you know take on this this little hurdle and this hiccup in your life how are you how are you handling that it, the dime size hiccup it really yeah. was the size of a dime um, well first you know it was a total shock. For me, I am the healthiest person I know. I'm a registered dietitian and a board certified health and wellness coach. So, you know, I I eat probably 10, 15 servings of veggies every day. I move my body probably at least an hour or two every single day. I love to move. Um, I, you know, get my sleep. I nursed for almost three years. So I've done everything right. So my first thing is it can happen to anybody. And I found out that I have dense breasts, dense, dense breasts, which is dense breast tissue. Breast tissue is fat and dense um, fibrous tissue. And that puts you at a higher risk. And it also makes it harder to read mammograms. So my mammogram actually was negative in October. And my uh, breast cancer was discovered in April through a breast density scan. So if you've gotten that little notice, your doctor, or your OBGYN has said to you, hey, you've got dense breasts, you should have the screening, get screened. If you haven't had your mammogram, please get your mammogram. I think it's kind of crazy out there, but a lot of women, an alarming number of women skip their mammograms because they're they're scared of breast cancer. And I'm here to say why my um, cancer was not a walk. I mean, I would say why, why it wasn't fun. It was a walk in the park compared to people I've talked to who have much more advanced. It was only in my breast very small, again, size of a dime. They were able to, I I had a lumpectomy, so I kept my breasts. Um, I had radiation, which really wasn't that bad. The hardest part of radiation was having to drive to and from the hospital every day, which is like about an hour each way. Mm -hmm. Um, I live in an island, so there's a drawbridge and you have to time it so you don't get stuck. 
before the drawbridge. Um, and all, then I have been doing some chemical treatments. So I didn't have chemo. I decided not to do chemo. Um, I've been doing an auto, um, an immunotherapy drug and then tons and tons of complementary. So mm -hmm. I have made some diet tweaks and changes, um, worked on some aspects of my life, doing a lot more detox things, getting things like vitamin um, C infusions. So I guess, um, it's it it was good in that it really flattened my workaholic. I have mm. to say, as you know, as being entrepreneurs, right, we can become wicked workaholics. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I worked all the time. I worked 100 hours a week. But like work, I was always thinking about work. Work was like I needed those dopamine hits of like something happening, like I need a big thing to happen. I need a new book, a new launch. I need more people following me. It was like this crazy craving for like more and more and more all the time. And I had to really look at that and go, whoo, slow it down. Let go of that workaholic. I come from a long line of workaholics and entrepreneurs. And I think there's an ancestral piece there as well. And I really had to work with a mentor and, and actually take a bunch of time off and, you know, when I take a lot of time off initially, I was super stressed, like you should be working, you should be doing something. This part of me would be like, come on, you should be working or you should be like, everything needs to be on Instagram. So I learned a lot about that. And I, and I have to say that I feel amazing. I feel better than I did before my diagnosis, even though my lifestyle was good. My lifestyle is even better now. I feel incredible. I'm, I'm really grateful and I don't take my life for granted. I enjoy every single day and I really can step into this amazing life that I created. I followed the steps in my book. I mean, before I wrote this book, you know, five years ago, I was in a marriage that was making me miserable. Um, I did have some health issues and I wasn't very happy. And now I'm rocking it. You are <laughs> rocking it. And congratulations. I think the you have uh, really touched on something that's very important and that is the fact that we work ourselves to exhaustion you know we live in the society that's live to work rather than work to live right and we we push we push we push we push and it sometimes takes something like this you know that that trauma that we can turn into the triumph basically the lesson the mess that we turn into the message and do you think that your cancer was that yeah, I do. I do, um, I do think that um, I, my ego needed to take a back seat. Yeah. Um, and I love what Dwayne Dyer says, you know, ego mm. is edging God out. And so I really feel like the ego is driving the ship. And what the interesting thing is that I'm working a lot less, like we, I think we were saying off the air is kind of, we only can really work four or five, maybe six hours a day. So I'm working less. Yeah, effectively. And, yeah, incredible opportunities are coming my way. So I was just on the cover of Aspire magazine for October and November. I get asked to write a forward in the book. Um, I was just on a panel in New York City, which was really exciting on pro aging. So I'm getting a lot of really great opportunities. Um, and I am just, you know, when you have that diagnosis, you realize the role that stress and this hustle culture plays in contributing to the dis ease. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't allow myself to get stressed out anymore. If I get upset and worked up, then it's like, wait a minute, you just don't, you can't go into that old pattern anymore because my life really does depend on it. I also found out that I have a BRCA mutation, mm. which is a, the BRCA is a gene. And when it, there is a mutation, it increases your risk of cancer. So I have a 50% chance of getting, you know, statistically I'm getting another breast cancer diagnosis, um, a higher risk of other cancers like ovarian cancer. So yeah, it definitely um, was a wake up call for me um, and an opportunity to share with more women to, you know, find joy like now, like don't put it off when you read books like The Regrets of Dying, right? They don't, they're like, I wish I'd made more money. I wish I had worked harder. They're all like, God, I wish I'd made time for my friends and my family. I wish I had traveled more. I wish I had been nicer to myself. So, I think midlife is a really good time to take a look at your life and see what's working. What's making me truly happy and what really lights me up? And then what's not working? What are the changes I need to make? Taking a really hard, deep dive on what is, um, what's fueling you and where do you want to go in your second adulthood and making those changes. It's so important. 
it's basically what's between the bookends that's really important, that story. Like, how do you want to live it? You know, things that we don't really realize. I think when we're younger on how we want to execute this, how we want to go forward with this, letting go of so much. Not the, I think the big thing that I hear about a lot is as we get older into this midlife, it's not taking things so seriously like you shared, but also like not being so connected to what other people think. It matters. Other people's uh, other people's opinions matter. But we as when we were younger, it was all about fitting in and and I don't want to say that and I don't want to put that out there. I'll even I'll even go so far as like even what you put out on the dating apps. You know, I look at myself like 15 years ago when I was first starting out to where on the dating apps even recently, how I write things is so differently because it's like I know who I am. I'm not changing for anybody. And I'm not asking you to change either, but there's a nice balance here if we can align and and we're right for each other. And I think that goes with any relationship. So sharing that and going through your journey, um, I'm, I imagine probably brought you to, there's a, a state of awareness there too. And I do want to remind those who are listening or watching on YouTube that if you are touch moved and inspired by this episode and this conversation with Dr. Ellen, give it a listen, subscribe, share it with somebody. Uh, if it can touch, move it, inspire somebody else, let somebody else know about this episode because it could make a huge difference without you even realizing it does. So thank you for all of you that are continuing to support the show, holistically speaking. So to Dr. Ellen, I want to ask you a question because we've talked about a lot of stuff. I'm curious, what is new and good in your life? Oh my goodness. What is new and good in my life? Well, besides the fact that I have an incredible man and I am engaged. So oh, I've congrats. been with Kenny. Oh my gosh. This month will be 20. I have to go next door and ask him. Um, it'll be about 28 months that we've been together. So a little bit. <laughs> so you're going to say 28 years. <laughs> 28 months. So it feels like it. And I'm so in love and Aww. he's so amazing. And we're so well suited. Very different. You know, you're talking about dating apps. I wanted something very different this time around. And we met in July of 2020 during COVID. And so I live on the Champlain Islands in Vermont. I live on this beautiful island between surf and turf. So I live right across the street from Lake Champlain. So I swim, I bike, I kayak, I cross country ski. On the other side is a dairy barn. And we have this ginormous garden and we put up incredible amounts of food. We think we put up 50, 60 jars of salsa so far yesterday. I was making pear puree to make some fruit leather. Um, I'm just, I wake up super excited. I'm working on another book, which is called, um, cancer was not on my vision board. So I'm excited about that. And I'm very, um, interested in a very different process and really talking about more of the, um, psycho, spiritual, emotional issues that go into cancer. I think there's a lot of books out there that talk about like how to beat it, what to eat, um, had it, you know, but this I'm working on that and just having fun. I'm going to travel more. I think this winter mm-hmm. we're looking at maybe going to Costa Rica. Unfortunately, what's happened in Florida is, um, kind of derailed our plans. I was, but, um, traveling more definitely. I want to visit my, uh, my eldest lives in Amsterdam. So I want to go visit uh, them. Uh, yeah. So love it. What a great laundry list of awesome things to rock the, rock the midlife. I want to ask you though, how did you meet your honey? Uh, spiritual singles. So if you are spiritually minded, it's a great, great app. It is a, you know, a boutique dating site. Let and me just write that down. Spiritual singles. <laughs> uh, because you know, it's so funny. I went on, I, I, you know, had gotten divorced. I spent some time with yeah. rebound guy. And then I was like, mm, time to mm. leave rebound guy and go out on my own. And I didn't, I did match, but unfortunately for some reason, I was a male looking for female and I couldn't change it. And it matches so overwhelming. And I would just Google, like, there must be like, where do you go if you're spiritually inclined um, and you're looking for somebody? And I have to say, I didn't even answer anybody's ads. It was like, I got just like waves and waves of incredible men met three Aquarius engineers. So clearly the universe was like, do the Aquarius engineer. And I would say the other thing I was doing is something called um, finding your destination vibration, Mm -hmm. which I talk about in Rock Your Midlife. And what you do with that is you visualize a time in your life where you were supremely, fill in the blanks of whatever emotion you want. For me, it was joy. Like joy is my favorite Mm -hmm. emotion. You know, maybe joy, maybe happiness, contentment, confidence, whatever it is. 
Um, and maybe that's just seeing yourself walking on a beach. For me, it was dancing because to me, dancing is a metaphor. I love to dance and dancing is a metaphor. You can go to go to uh, the Midlife Whisper on Instagram and see me dancing occasionally. Um, but it was a metaphor for having more joy in my life. So I would see myself dancing when I was five and six as a kid and then in my 20s. And then I feel like I attracted Kenny because I had this joyful energy. And of course, he loves to dance. and He's a great dancer and he's just yummy. And he's he's smart. He's spiritual. He's supportive. Um, the man would do anything for me. He's successful. And so it's just uh, but we have we both have so much give each other so much space. Mm. And in midlife, you don't have you're not thinking about like you know, getting the house, having the kids. So midlife romance is really, I, I'm finding it very un, um, very freeing, very fun, very sexy. And actually another thing that is on my list is this time next year, as we're looking into winter, um, I want to get an RV and I want to have my book oh, and go yeah. on a book tour and travel across the Love country that. with my man in an RV. I've done that. I did it for about two or three weeks. And I remember it was, it, it to this day, with all the traveling I've done all over the world, that was one of my most favorite trips, just sleeping under the stars, pulling up at a campsite, having the the, the person that you want to be with, waking up and, and having my morning coffee and seeing an elk feeding its young right outside. Like the 24 hours earlier, I was at Newark Airport. So I get it. There's something about connecting with nature that is so important. And if you can do that, please do it. I think that is the most amazing adventure ever. And I love, I love you talk like you, you talk like a, like a young love, like a high schooler. I love it. I mean, it's, it's seriously, I, I can see it shining through you and I wish you all the best with that. So do you have a, a wedding date planned? We don't. I've got the ring. So if you're oh, watching, beautiful. Um, <laughs> you know, in midlife, I think with COVID and yeah. also you have to think of some financial things, like does it make sure. sense for tax perspective, things like that. I mean, we feel like we're married and I call yeah. him my husband, even though it's interesting because I don't, I don't think of him as my husband because I have sort of these other, we're talking about sort of tri trauma to triumph. Mm -hmm. And so I don't associate him, associate this relationship is so different. It's a completely different animal than my first marriage. Yeah. Um, and so he doesn't feel like this sort of like exactly the same. It feels young. It feels fun. It feels like we're playing at being grown up and married. And it's really, really a good time. Well, what's so interesting is that you mentioned that you've been together 28 months, which basically is the pandemic. So did right. you met during the pandemic? We met July 2020, right? July 14th, 2020 on Bastille wow. Day. Wow. He arrived at my apartment with two dozen roses and a cooler filled with produce. And I made dinner, even though I know you're not supposed to like invite somebody in for the first day, but it was COVID and we talked a bunch and I knew that it was going to be something special. And I wanted our first date to be amazing. So we made, we made zoodles and we made, I made vegan pesto and we, you know, I roasted cauliflower and I made um, stuffed, stuffed squash blossoms for the mm. first time ever. Very ambitious menu, but um it won him over and we have been together ever since. Yeah. Second well, date, we went to my friend's wedding, which was, she was having an outside second wedding, like, mm -hmm. but it was like, had all my friends check him out and they're like, yep. Yeah. That's the yeah, true test. This, this, the seal of approval. Were you living, were you living up there at the time? I was living in Burlington. So okay. So I you're still in Vermont. Yeah. And when I rolled up I, the, the theme, then so his, his place, which is now my place for the first time, the theme song from Gone with the Wind was going on in my mind. I was like, what? I was a little worried about um, feeling isolated up here, but I've had I met great friends and mm. Burlington's not very far. So I, I feel don't feel isolated at all. And then talking about nature, I mean, we have like deer just literally we don't actually won't Beautiful. want them close to the garden, but we've got right. a border collie. But I mean, I see deer every day. I see eagles, geese. I mean, the geese fly right over. We have tons of migrating birds. And the mm. former owner was a florist. So it's like fireworks all spring, summer into fall with beautiful blossoms. So Especially this time with the peak season. It must be yep. spectacular. Okay. We've shared a lot here. I love this. I love everything you're sharing. And I love that you share a little bit more about your personal side as well, just with the relationship, because I think this is a time in our lives where we do see a lot of the divorces happening, a lot of the empty nests happening, uh, a lot of people that are having that huge transition, not just in their personal well-being, but also in the relationships around them. And I think you mentioned that earlier. It's like aligning with who you want to be with. And I've been through the divorce as well. I totally get it. And I think the relationships that are around me in this time in my life are completely different, aside from those who have been there the whole ride because they've just always been a part of the tribe, the Moai, right? But 
I want to ask you a couple questions. I do this with my guests, but first I want to mention to folks that Dr. Ellen is graciously giving away a copy of her book, Rock Your Mid life. And I keep wanting to say midwife. I have to talk very carefully when I'm saying it. Rock your midlife. Don't rock your midwife. Please don't. (laughs) But uh, we're going to be giving away a copy of that book. And she's also giving away a freebie, which I love this 10 tips to rock your midlife. And uh, that'll all be available on the podcast page and in the listen notes, wherever you're listening or watching this podcast. But here we go. I want to ask you some questions. I usually do this with my guests towards the end. And we're going to do a little rapid fire. So I've written down a number of words that you've mentioned during our conversation. I'm going to take a brief pause, let you think about it. And you're just going to come back in rapid fire word association. Come back with the first word that comes to mind. All right. All right. Are you ready? I am. All right. Here we go. Woman. Fabulous. Spiritual. Deep. Whisperer. Shh. That's good. I like a word. I haven't had anybody do that. Midlife. The best time of life. Menopause. One word. That's okay. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. (laughs) (laughs) Menopause. Okay. Paramenopause. Through. Mm. Author. Authentic. Cancer. Strength. Sex. Fun. Agreed. (laughs) Midlife. Awesome. Mm. Amen to that. I will join you on that journey, my dear. Definitely. You're empowering. I love that. I mean, it's good to be around women that really touch, move, and inspire. And I say it all the time on this podcast. And just whenever I'm in the surrounding of people that I just really align with that every person I talk to is like a master class. So I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your experiences on the show. I know it's going to really resonate with a lot of people and um, just keep rocking your own midwife. <laughs> I will said it again. <laughs> it's almost like what you were saying, the havening. No, it was I keep like saying- ha- havening. I know, I'm not, but, you just know I'm, but we need to get a good night's sleep so yes. that we can process the information. Oh my gosh. Then- do it the next day, right? I, it's just, you know, it, it's all good. And every, we just have to be easy on ourselves, right? We just have to be easy on ourselves. So that's the we way will, we will continue to rock our midlife. And I want to give you a moment to leave some words of wisdom with, with Holistically Speaking's tribe. What would you like you to know, share? Just be and love your damn self, mm. you know, be yourself, love yourself, take care of yourself, let the guilt go. Guilt is so not a productive emotion unless you're feeling it because there's a behavior that you really need to change. But I think we do so much because we are driven by these, um, the inner child mm. that the, you know, the inner family of guilt and people pleaser and self-critic, all of these structures that were put in place to protect us from danger through trauma. And this is a powerful time. And I'm sure you give people so much wisdom on your beautiful show around how to deal with the, when trauma comes up, feel it, you heal it, you know, name it. This is, this is old stuff. This is my old people pleaser, but you know, you can, you can change, forgive yourself, move on you only have now and the rest of your life is in front of you. Oh, love it. Thank you so much. So beautiful. Thank you for being here. You're a gift. And I appreciate you sharing everything that you are and your whispers of wisdom. If you want a chance to take home Dr. Ellen's book, Rock Your Midlife, I share details in the notes of this episode wherever you are listening or watching on how to enter that giveaway. And while you're there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. Dr. Ellen is also offering a free download to 10 tips to rock your midlife. And you know what? I'm gonna throw in something a little extra too. You've got a chance to win the book. You are getting Dr. Ellen's 10 amazing tips. And I'm going to throw in a free download to my guided self-havening experience with me 
on how to handle those hormones and those hot flashes. And I'm speaking from experience. So there's something in there for everyone. Of course, I'll be sure to share all of the information about Dr. Ellen, including her podcast, Rock Your Midlife, which I had the pleasure of being on recently. So it'll give you a chance to listen to a lot of great content. Special thanks to my team at Two Market Media, as well as Lip Bone Redding, who is the music behind this show. And if you're thinking of starting your own podcast, give Squadcast a try. Just use the special link that is in my podcast notes for a free seven day trial. You got nothing to lose. Of course, if you found this episode helpful in any way, or you know someone who might find value in it, or what Dr. Ellen had to share, just go ahead and pay it forward. You got nothing to lose. Okay, it's time to get out there, rock your midlife, be kind to your mind, and find your joy. Holistically speaking, I'll see you there. I know.